Hey, happy Easter. How are we doing today? Joyeuse Pack, we're so grateful that you spent time of your holiday weekend. How many people had to fight some traffic to get here? Whoa, it's busy out there, isn't it? It's one of the great things about being across the street from one of the great landmarks of our whole province. We get a lot of parking uh, confusion. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about something that I think is kind of interesting. There's something very delicious about getting away with something, isn't there? Delicious. It is delicious. I remember when I was a kid in my high school career and even leading up to that, I used to pray for a snow day. How many people used to do that? There's a test coming, a math test on Monday. I was just praying, God, please, I'm not ready for this math test, please. And twice God answered that prayer in about 20 years. But that was a delicious Monday morning when I woke up. You know, we were tough back in those days. It wasn't like a little bit of snow on the ground. Like it was up to here that we got canceled school. Like back in my day, we were a little tougher. This summer, my family and I, we were in Texas. My wife is from Texas. We took a long 30-hour journey down to Texas to enjoy being with family. And I was so freaked out because I was on the highway. I wasn't really paying attention to my speed, and I saw the lights behind me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, here we go again, a foreigner in a foreign land. I got to, you know, get this big spe you know, speeding ticket, losing points off my insurance. I was like, going through the motions already, like, how much is it going to cost me? What story am I going to tell the police officer? The lights were following me. And I was the only one down the highway. And then the car went right past me, and I just exhaled a big sigh of relief. It was delicious. I got away with it. My wife, we've been married for 21 years. My wife loves presents and I was really stressing it. I still get stressed out at Valentine's Day. Any guys can understand that? Birthdays, Valentine's Day, it doesn't matter what it is. I always get a little bit of anxiety. And a couple of times my wife has said to me, you know what, let's not do presents this year. I'm just like, oh my gosh, thank the Lord. I, I just, I, I love you so much more now than I ever have. I was, I had something and it wasn't good. I just threw it in the garbage. I was like, this is embarrassing. There's something so delicious about getting away with something. The second chances we get from a police officer, from a teacher, from a parent, when we get away with something and get a second chance, it is such a delicious feeling. And not surprisingly, I'm sure you're, you're getting the drift on this, Easter is a delicious story of a second chance. It's a story... Uh, I've been a pastor now for over 20 years and I've told this story. And I got to tell you, there's a little bit of anxiety preaching the Easter message because everybody's heard it before. It doesn't matter if you've been to church once in your life. This is the first time in church you've been here. For, everybody knows the basic plot of the Easter story. Didn't our kids do an amazing job, by the way? Thank you. Thank you to our Broussard kids. And so, you know, there is a lot of anxiety because everybody knows the story. And yet what I've discovered in the word of God is that it's always fresh. If you can come to it with a little bit of humility, there's something fresh for us to understand and fresh revelation for us to understand. And again, whether you're a skeptic or an atheist, whether you're first time in church or whether you're coming back for the first time in a long time, or whether you're a citizen, you've been here for a long time and you, this is your, your home. We just wanna present to you this message and just give you an opportunity to show, you, to show you something that I saw for the first time as I was studying. So if you have a Bible, we're gonna be in Luke chapter 23, but if you don't, the verses will be behind you. And I wanna share a little bit of the Easter story and, and a story really about somebody getting away with something, someone that could not imagine the second chance that he got. So I'm gonna tell the story of the arrest of Jesus before Pilate, Luke chapter 23, verse 12 and 13, going to verse 25. The story says this, that Pilate, he called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, the Jews. And he said to them, you brought this man as one who was inciting the people for rebellion, but I have examined him in your presence and I found no basis for your charges against him. And neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I'll punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Now Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection, rebellion, in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate again appealed to them, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why, why? 
What crime has this man committed? I have found him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But, but with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one that they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. It's a fascinating story that it tells the account of Pilate who was a Roman governor over this region, including Jerusalem, the holy city of Israel. It talks about the the high priests and the leaders of Judaism of its day conspiring together during the nighttime. Six different trials took place to bring guilt against Jesus. And now Jesus is in front of Pilate, the only one who can grant the death penalty. And both he and the other governor named Herod both concluded that Jesus was innocent. And yet because of the shouts and because of a politician wanting to appease his constituents, he gives into their demands and he sentenced Jesus to death. While at the same time, the fascinating, the ironic part of the story is that Barabbas was a murderer. He was guilty of murder and he was guilty of inciting rebellion. Now, if you know anything about the Romans, they were experts of quelling rebellions. In fact, the whole reason why there was a cross, why there was a crucifixion, it was invented to bring rebellions down. Crucifixions were invented by the Romans to bring the most painful, but also the most shameful death possible. And here, a murderer that was involved in rebellion, that was bringing rebellion to the streets of Jerusalem, he got to go free while Jesus, who was innocent, got the cross and got execution. It's very fascinating because the word Barabbas, if you know a little bit of the Semitic languages, I know you've been brushing up on your Aramaic and Hebrew this morning before you got to church this morning. You guys all look so nice, by the way. If you know anything about uh, Aramaic, I, I don't know a lot. I just, I read this, but the word Barabbas, the word bar means son. The word Abba means father. So his name means the son of the father. It's interesting. We don't know why his father was significant, but he was known by the name of his father. He's called the son of the father. When I was younger, I had three younger brothers. My, my sons are on the front row, and so they, they are brothers. And I have three younger brothers in Ottawa, grew up. And uh, I, I'll never forget this little slogan that my dad told me one time. Whenever I got in trouble, he said this, hey, you do the, t- you do the crime, you do the time. How many people have ever heard that before? You do the crime, you do the time. One time I uh, assaulted my brother. I don't know if they call it that in the family got a little aggressive when I was wrestling and maybe took a little shot to one of my brothers. Some people might call that assault. I don't think so, but it's part of just quelling the rebellion in the home, right? And my dad caught me and he said, hey, you do the crime, you do the time. There's a punishment, there's a consequence for acting out. And it's funny because I thought my, my dad was so wise, but actually he picked this up from the Bible. Later on in the story, there's a man named Saul and he was actually a murderer. He would be known today as an accessory for murder. He was very upset that this Jesus and the story of Jesus was spreading around Jerusalem, around Israel. He was a very devout Jew and he didn't want anybody to be telling people about Jesus and the resurrection and the Messiah. He called that anathema. And so in this early part of the church, this man named Saul was approving and actually commanding people to stone and put to death these first Christians. And yet later in his life, this man had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus and his whole heart, his whole life transformed. And my dad said, you do the crime, you do the time. And God had something very similar to say to us today. He said in Romans chapter 6, 23, now this is the word Paul quoting this. He said, for the wages of sin is death. The wages, what we earn for our rebellion against God, our self-centeredness, or as we talked about last Sunday, the self-righteousness that many Christians, why many people don't want to go to church is because of the hypocrisy and the self-righteousness of religious people, that we can be lost because of our self-righteousness, but also our rebellion. Paul says the wages of sin is death. But, but, here's the hinge of the Easter Sunday, but, The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The wages of sin is death. 
And we know in our world today, as we scan over the war in Ukraine and the war in Palestine, that this bears out that because in, in the city of Montreal, my first couple of years living in Montreal, we moved here in 2011, the first couple of mayors that were elected while I was living here were arrested on corruption. And so we know that the wages of corruption brings a whole city down, that a city grinds to a halt when there's corruption in politicians and corruption in city and contracts that are not on the up and up. It can bring the whole city down because the money that should be there is not there. And so the poor suffer and our roads suffer and people suffer because of corruption. We know that in Palestine and in Ukraine, that the wages of war, it leads to the death of innocent people every time. War always leads not just to the soldiers dying, but innocent people dying. One of the tragedies of this whole situation is that it's the kids that are paying the price. It's the innocents who are paying the price of war. And so we know even in a non-religious context that the wages of sin is death. It grinds a city to a halt. It brings innocence to their life to a premature level. And maybe on a more practical level, the wages of adultery when somebody steps outside their marriage and it brings another person into that relationship. It not just brings a marriage down, but it brings the kids down as well. There's collateral damage for the choices that we make. And my dad said, you do the crime, you pay the fine, right? And it's the same idea. Paul continues on and he said this about the story of Barabbas, which is such a fascinating story that this man who deserved to die, who was already convicted of murder, a man who is already deserving of death and to be executed in a very public way. He's allowed to go free and Jesus has to take his place. Paul writing about that reality in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. He says this to us today, because I know, because I've been in your seat before, this story can just be a story that, oh, it's a nice story. It's a heartwarming for, st story, or maybe it's a metaphor or it's a spiritual thing, but it doesn't really affect my life. I've been in your seat before. I understand that those are the thoughts sometimes that we think when we hear messages like this from a, a word that we're not really sure we can trust. But for 2000 years, people like us have gathered together in places like this to tell the story of the cross and the resurrection. And here's how it's personal for us. Paul says this, we implore you on Christ's behalf, verse 20. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We implore you on God's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now here's what he says in verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So what Paul's talking about, God put the sin of all of us, our self-centeredness, our self-righteousness, our religiousness, and also the very many ways that we've hurt other people, the ways that we've squandered our opportunities. God made him, Jesus, to become sin for us so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. You know what Easter is the story of? It's the story of the delicious second chance that you and I get. That we get something that we do not deserve. Not only do we get mercy, that we deserve to be separated from God, that we have shaken our fist at God and his rules. We've shaken his fist at living the life that he's asked us to live. Instead, we go our own way. Or as I mentioned, that sometimes we put religion and rules in the way and we try to pretend that we are our own savior that Jesus came so that he could come and die in our place. So he not only takes away the punishment, but the second part, if you paid attention to it, is not only do we, are we not guilty, but we're also given the righteousness of Jesus. That when, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've invited Jesus, you've trusted Jesus for his death and resurrection. If you've invited him to lead your life, then not only are you not guilty, but you are seen through the lens of the Holy Son of God. You are pure. You are a saint. You are a holy person of God. And you might look at, you might think, who, me? Who, me? But the reality is that because of Jesus, that we get everything from his account, we don't get anything from our account. Resurrection story. As we know the story, Jesus was laid in the grave on the Passover. 
right before the dawning of the Sabbath on Friday night, he was put in the tomb from Joseph of Arimathea and for hours became days. And Saturday, yesterday was the day that many theologians call Holy Saturday. It's the day between the gaps. When the first followers of Jesus were waiting and wondering and bewildered and confused. You know, that first Sunday morning, nobody was ready to sing the Easter Sunday song because everybody was depressed. Everybody thought that this Jesus was going to be the Messiah, that this Jesus was going to be the Savior, but nobody expected no body. Nobody expected on that first Sunday that Jesus would actually be alive again. And yet those angels said to the women that came to the tomb, he is risen. The stone was rolled away. And maybe you're thinking this, yeah, but pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the, the wake of bodies behind me. You don't, you don't know how I've squandered my life. You don't know how I've run away from my parents' authority or I've done this or done that. You don't know all the different things, the addictions and the things I've been carrying, the shame and the guilt that I've been walking with my whole life. And you're right, I don't know, but Jesus does. And he said, if you will give your life to him, that he will not only take your guilt and condemnation, but also he will credit to your account the righteousness of Jesus. God made him who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Barabbas, as I mentioned, his name, it means son of the father. You know, what's really ironic about the Easter story. Barabbas, his name means the son of the father. And ironically, the son of God was condemned so that the son of the father could go free. Jesus, the true son of the father, the, the one who came from heaven for us that we celebrate at Christmas, the true son of the father was condemned so that Barabbas could go free. Barabbas, who was guilty, tried. Can you just imagine the minutes leading up to that trial? Barabbas is with the other two thieves that are about to get executed with Jesus. And they hear shouts outside the prison. They're in this dark and dank prison in the basement of the, of the prison walls. And they suddenly hear shouts of crucify him, crucify him. And immediately there's this terror that goes into the, the heart of Barabbas and the thieves because they know that their hour is up. And yet the soldiers bring him up. They bring him up before the people. They bring him up before Pilate. And instead of getting sentenced to death, they take off the shackles on his feet and on his hands. And they say, you can walk free. The nails that belong to Barabbas get put into the hands and the feet of Jesus. Barabbas, the son of the father is free so that the son of God could be condemned. Easter is the story that reminds all of us that I am Barabbas. I deserved death. I deserve to be condemned because of my self-righteousness, because of my rebellion, because I've shaken my fist at God at times. I deserve to be sentenced. And yet Jesus went to the cross for me. You know what Easter is the story of? I hate to, I have to break it to you because you guys all look so nice today but you also are Barabbas. The Bible says there is no one righteous, no, not one. All of us deserve, we've stand guilty before God. And the only way that we can receive life eternal today and life into eternity after you die is if you receive a gift. Again, Romans chapter six, verse 23. I wanna read it one more time. The wages of sin is death. I, I love English. I love literature. I got a, we have an English professor in the fourth row here, right? That word, but is an important, but right. The wages of sin is death, but, but the hope of Easter is this, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. You and I are Barabbas. You and I are guilty before God. You and I have shame that we cannot cover ourselves. As much as you and I have tried, we cannot save ourselves. And one day the word of God reminds us that one day we will stand before a holy God and give an account for our life. And we can do one or two things in front of that holy God. 
We can apply the payment for Jesus's blood and his death, or we can pay ourselves. But make no mistake, one day we will have to pay. You can ask Jesus to pay for you, or you can pay your life yourself. And if you decide to have that, then you will spend eternity away from God. The wages of sin is death. And so the question is this question. Will you allow Jesus to pay for your debt? Will you allow Jesus to free you as the Barabbas in front of us? You and I are deserved to be condemned to die. We've got shame. We've got guilt. We've got condemnation. We've tried so many different ways to fix our life and we can't do it. And Jesus, because of the open tomb, it's an open invitation to you today. Jesus is not in a grave. Jesus stands right now with his arms wide open. And make no mistake, the image that Jesus is painted with in the resurrection, he's got the scars on his hand. He's got the scars on his feet to prove that his sacrifice was a victory for you and for me. So will you allow Jesus to pay for your debt? Will you receive the gift that Jesus paid for you? Paul said, I implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Easter is the open tomb and the open invitation that you today can be reconciled to a holy God, a God who created the heavens and the earth, a God who knows the hairs on your head, a God that knows your past, your present, and your future. And he stands in the gap for you to give you an invitation right now to come, receive the gift of salvation, to receive the gift of eternal life. A couple of minutes ago, as we get ready for the service, I talked to somebody that just lost a loved one. And, and I can't help think about Easter without thinking about the death of my father uh, back in 2010. He had leukemia and he passed away. And so it's been 14 years now. And so Easter is not simply about a spiritual reality that one day I'll be in heaven, but Paul talks about eternal life. And it's, it's both about quantity and quality. Because the kind of life that Jesus invites us to, it's not a a wait till you die kind of situation. It's that he wants to walk with you through the valleys of life. He wants to give you a quality of life that is so wonderful, the abundant life today that will only get better into eternity. And so even as I preach this message and, and remind you and give you, implore you to be reconciled, my dad had a relationship with Jesus and he gave me that invitation as well. And so I've got tremendous hope. I got tremendous confidence that one day, I'll be reunited with my father. Life is short, but eternity is long. Life is difficult and we can't do life alone. We invite you today to get reconciled to God. Can I invite you just to stand up? We're gonna sing a couple of songs of response because I know this is a heavy message and it's, wow, this is a lot to process. This is a lot going on. And here's kind of the cliffhanger of the story. We don't know what happened to Barabbas. Like, did he get his life right? Like, did he actually understand? Did he watch Jesus get executed for him? Or did he just run away because he was so happy to be free? The Bible is unclear about what happened to Barabbas. And it's possible that he used that second chance not to change his life and not to receive the ultimate forgiveness through Jesus, but he just carried on living as he always did and got back into the same ditches. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, that one decision, that one catalyst of seeing Jesus take the shackles that he deserved, that Jesus taking the nails that he deserved, that that love that was poured out for him was such a revolutionary love that he himself received the gift of salvation. Have you received the gift? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Have you been reconciled to God. If you were to die today, would you know that you could stand before God and say, Jesus covered me. Jesus wants to walk with you through life, but he also wants to pay the debt that only Jesus can pay. Are you tired of running? Are you trying to, are you tired of trying to solve your problems on your own? Are you, are you tired of trying to fix the issues that have been the same chronic issues your whole life? Jesus wants to come in and to transform your heart, to transform your destiny And so I want to invite you just to bow your heads for a moment. If you've already made a decision to trust Jesus, can I just ask you to do something on behalf of Jesus? Will you live for him? He died for you so that he could live through you. 
Will you be the light of our city? Will you be the most kind, the most patient, the most servant oriented? That Jesus, who was the servant, he invites you to be the servant of our city. That he wants you to go last so that others can go first. He wants you to model your life after him. And perhaps there's one person here, maybe there's two, that today, that this message is for you that you find yourself in the, in the seat of Barabbas, and that Jesus is inviting you right now to be reconciled to God. That you don't have to pay for your past. You don't have to pay for your condemnation. You don't have to walk around with a backpack full of guilt. Today, you can lay that down at the cross and receive the mercy of God. So will you pray with me? Today, if you wanna give your life to Jesus, if you just wanna lift up your hand just to say, Jesus, will you remember me when you come back in your kingdom? Just as Jesus was dying, there was two thieves between him on the cross. And one said, remember me in paradise. And that's all it took. Jesus said, I will remember you. You will today surely be with me in paradise. So today, I urge you, don't put it off. Stop running. Stop trying to fix yourself. Stop trying to medicate your addictions or medicate the different things you're walking around with. Allow Jesus to transform your heart and your destiny. Allow him to give you the freedom and the peace and the power that can only come from a God who's been resurrected from the grave. So if that's you today, as we bow our heads, just everyone's eyes, just as a word of respect for those who wanna make that decision, would you just bow your heads with me? And today, if you wanna receive the invitation of Jesus, will you just, in a moment, slip up your hand quickly just so we can acknowledge you so that we can pray for you. And most of all, so that God would see the intention of your heart, that you would take the place of Barabbas today that you would allow Jesus to pay the debt that you can't pay. Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful story, this powerful story, Jesus, of how you took the life of a guilty person. You who were the son of the father, the son of the living God, you were condemned to die so that the Barabbases in here could go free. Jesus, we ask that you would reconcile people to you today. We ask that you would hear their cries, Father, that you would forgive them, you would set them free, that God, you give them a new purpose and a new life and a new heart. And so if that's you today, would you just slip up your hand to say, Jesus, would you save me? Jesus, would you remember me? Jesus, today I decide to become one of your followers. Help me to experience your love and the transformation of Jesus. Father, we thank you for these hands that have been raised. God, you see the intention of every heart. We thank you for the promise of Easter that you are coming again soon. Thank you that the, the tomb is empty, that we serve a living God, that you are available for us 24 seven. We don't have to go through a pastor or a priest, that God, that you are available to hear our cries. And so Jesus, we cry out to you, come. Come into our hearts, come into our lives, change our minds, change our hearts, change our destinies. We pray this all in the resurrected name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.